pleasure to introduce uh, to you Edwin Fortung, he's professor, associate professor at um, Resin Lab Polytechnic Institute in New York. Uh, he is actually a um, visiting scientist, a visiting professor at the University of Lynx, even if he's not physically here, unfortunately, for uh, corona related issues. Uh, so, um, Edwin has been working uh, a long time now on uh, nanoscale structure, fluctuation and dynamics um, due to coupled and competing spin, orbital ch charge and lattice degrees of freedom, and it uses coherent diffraction, uh, also non-purely uh, coherent imaging methods, and neutron scattering. Uh, he's been professor also at Los Alamos uh, before uh, taking this um, position in New York. Uh, so he's the first of uh, uh, people who will contribute actually. So this is not a lecture on coherence on principles, it's really an example of application of these methods that we learned uh, of to a real, uh, um, real life example, so a scientific example. Uh, next talk, um, on a similar topic, so application of coherence to uh, nanostructures is going to be given next week from uh, Alex Bierling, who is also in the audience with us. Uh, so uh, next few seminars will be actually dedicated also to applications. So Edwin, please start. Awesome. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dina, for the, uh, the, uh, the very nice um, introduction. So I'll, I'll be talking today about, uh, I'm not gonna go uh, so much detail into, uh, into coherent diffraction imaging, specifically uh, BRAC CDI. I think uh, uh, Dima, Dimitri, she gave, gave a very, very nice uh, intro and a uh, uh, series of uh, codes and phasing algorithms that we use uh, for CDI. I'm, I'm gonna focus here on one of the applications of CDI, uh, specifically BCDI to uh, spatially resolve um, uh, topological uh, defects in, in uh, ferroelectric uh, nanocrystals. And I'm gonna try to give uh, uh, the motivation for, for why topological defects and uh, what are topological defects within the, uh, the context of, uh, of uh, ferroelectricity, uh, um, globally multiferroic materials for energy uh, uh, storage and uh, and uh, and uh, processing and and just like the the uh, the the motto of our university says that why not change the world? I'm hoping that uh, CDI and um, the advances that we're making in synchrotron and uh, and photon science would be uniquely suited to to usher us into the next um, civilization age. Um, that's a very big word I use with my students. So I should um, I want to acknowledge the. Uh, uh, the uh, the funding agencies and just a few collaborators and some of uh, the light sources that I am uh, able to perform this work in, especially in Los Alamos National Laboratory, where I uh, was previously, I was the uh, the lands professor of neutron scattering. I, I still have uh, an affiliate position with them and we uh, use that collaboration to work on the state-of-the-art samples and the uh, Department of N uh, DOD for funding some of this research, of course, the Department of Energy and NSF, I should have also included them. And uh, most of my experiments are done out here in the US in, uh, in the East Coast with uh, Ross and uh, Wonsuk. Okay. So I, I wanna start off uh, with this uh, to give a little bit of motivation. I, this is a paper from uh, Nicola Spaudin and, um, and Ramesh, where they list a uh, uh, top, 10 science and uh, uh, technological challenges. And uh, I, I try to highlight some of the few, but most of them are, if not all, are inherently uh, applicable to ferroelectrics and, uh, and to multiferroid globally, uh, nanoferroelectrics and uh, multiferroid. So discovery of uh, of a new room temperature multiferroid with robust coupling between magnetism and ferroelectricity. So basically being able to have a, a material that shows the, has the coexistence of the um, electric polarization uh, and uh, or electric degree of freedom and magnetic degree of freedom, meaning uh, in the presence of an external uh, electric field, you can control the magnetic uh, 
texture, not just domain, and induce uh, different uh, stable, lower symmetrical form of uh, magnetic uh, uh, textures, topological textures, or in the presence of an electric field, you can tune uh, the uh, also the magnetic texture. So this would be extremely interesting, especially at room temperature. There's a lot of uh, priority for this, but there are issues of uh, of leakages and uh, and uh, uh, high remnant magnetic moment and stuff like that. And if you go through this list from the scientific to the technological, you you see uh, uh, two underlying principles there. We uh, we need uh, routes uh, approaches in which we can actually nanofabricate uh, process and control structures at the nanoscale, and more specifically, how we can non destructively uh, probe them uh, in situ. For example, if you if you want to design a, a a, a nanoscale uh, ferroelectric uh, system that has a spontaneous polarization of about one to five uh, micro uh, coulomb per centimeter square. The only way to non-destructively test that would be to design the, uh, these given types of ferroelectric capacitors, for example, and put them in your beam and perform in situ in operando experiments. So we actually sit very comfortably, most of us using uh, synchrotron facilities and, and X fields to actually address some of these issues. And um, if you want to, uh, you want to focus specifically on random access uh, memory, which we use in, um, in our computer storage. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a slide from the uh, Journal of Material Science and, uh, and Electronic. Uh, this, uh, for example, bismuth ferrite, is uh, one of the very popular multi-ferroic material. It has uh, the coupling between the ferroelectric order parameter and the magnetic order parameter. Uh, the challenge is that the uh, the order temperature, the multi-ferroic temperature, is uh, is not at room temperature. So there is this push to design, develop room temperature multi-ferroic uh, materials where you can control the other parameters and, and switch the properties at room temperature. So. Uh, this system can be used as an FE RAM. It is ferroelectric. It has a, I'm going to define ferroelectricity. I'm going to get into that. It has a, a, a spontaneous polarization. So symmetry is broken, broken in the absence of an electric uh, field. And so bismuth ferrite uh, has this type of uh, a hysteresis loop between the E and the P field. It, uh, it, it, it's used, it has very fast processing and uh, small uh, storage density. So it's, uh, it's good enough. And then you have the magnetic rams. This is a prototypical example. It has a low storage density and it, it has a uh, slow processing. Most of this has to do with the dynamical behavior of this, uh, the other parameter, which for this case is the, is the magnetic uh, dipole orientation. So it's the magnetic domains. And for this case is the, ferroelectric uh, dipolar orientation, which has now ferroelectric uh, domains. Then of course you have the magnetoelectric RAM where you you take advantage of the multi-ferroic property of the of a bismuth ferrite. Uh, but most of these systems to achieve them, we have to perform some sort of uh, processing, for, ex for example, doping. So we, we introduce a, a magnesium, uh, uh, substitutional atoms into bismuth uh, ferrite and and then there are a couple of challenges that come from the structural perspective the the atomic radius of uh, of uh, magnesium it's not very very comparable to iron so it uh, that's why it it acts it's a uh, it, it it might actually occupy interstitial sites at some point and it becomes a bit of a hindrance because it 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 can not just alter the elastic properties of the crystal, but sometimes you could pin magnetic domains. Those are some of the, the challenges. So there's this push to have a, a chemically homogeneous, so a system that is chemically homogeneous and you can control it with an electric and magnetic field while you are still getting the benefit of uh, achieving uh, high storage density and uh, fast processing. And uh, one of the routes uh, towards this goal is to is to look at other parameters in uh, in complex ferroics uh, and here I, I 
uh, I, I show a list of uh, specific types of systems and I am listing the other parameters and the conjugate fields. So the conjugate fields are the external stimuli in the conjugate space that you can you can use to control the other parameter. And normally uh, to understand uh, most all these materials go through a given phase transition where the system changes from uh, a higher symmetry disordered phase to uh, a lower symmetry order phase. Now, this uh, phase transition, normally when you have phase transition, if you look at very simplistic phase transition, for example, in water, water to ice, water to vapor, uh, you do have uh, phase boundaries. If you, uh, the phase boundaries have very, very interesting properties. The phase boundaries, for example, could, uh, they are not usually in, 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 the para in, the, in the other parameter space, they are not thin. They could be thick enough, they could behave as domain walls if you're looking at the other parameter of, uh, of ferroelectric polarization. So if you are in a ferroelectric phase, so you can, uh, you can look at ferroelectricity from a global uh, uh, phase space, you have a higher symmetric cubic phase in which the, uh, the, the crystal is, doesn't have uh, ferroelectricity due to the inversion symmetrical nation. And if you cool it down into a ferroelectric phase, now ferroelectricity itself has different uh, ground states that have uh, energetically uh, stable enough. You have the orthorhombic, you have uh, uh, monoclinic, and, and uh, you have tetragonal and stuff like that. Now within this phase, these phases in the ferroelectric phase, you can have phase transformations and transition. Now these phase transitions, uh, they are usually uh, accompanied by nucleations of uh, topological defects. So just like uh, the particle physicist tells that when the uh, uh, the Big Bang, you had the universe that uh, expanded rapidly and then it started cooling and this cooling process, which is a phase transition, was accompanied by uh, the nucleation formations of uh, topological defects. So basically textures of the other parameter that are topologically protected uh, are able to form. So we can use uh, Landau uh, Landau's theory to understand how uh, other parameters and uh, conjugate feel for uh, our own application in uh, technology, how we could use them to uh, store higher density information and uh, achieve uh, faster processing. So I'm going to focus mostly on the ferroelectric ca uh, case in here. I would, I would double a little bit into the ferroelastic if I have enough time, then I would mention uh, a scenario also of the magnetoelectric uh, case. So the most important thing here is that if you look at this is the, uh, the Landau free energy, the free energy of the system, you can expand it as a polynomial. This was uh, uh, actually uh, given by uh, Landau, uh, Leif Landau uh, uh, a long time ago. The other parameter here is, uh, I'll call it N. You, if you are Expanding, if you're looking at the free energy of a ferroelectric system, you can expand this in the polynomial of the polarization. Now, when it is uh, cubic versus ferroelectric, I'm going to go into a little bit detail about that. But the interesting thing is that the free energy now becomes, uh, it's a multifunctional, it becomes a function of the polarization for this case. And you can minimize the free energy with respect to the polarization. Now that minimization, it means that you're looking for stability, you're looking for stable equilibrium. Um, uh, what, what, what states are stable as you're lowering the symmetry of the system. So the ferroelectric order parameter, which is the uh, uh, spontaneous polarization, you traditionally, you, if you increase an electric, if you add an, if you increase the electric field in a ferroelectric crystal, you raise up the electric field. The microstructure, if you look at the microstructure, you will, basically you're switching uh, domains. So, so if the system is a thin film on a substrate, you have a couple of uh, any competing energies. You have the elastic energy that comes in from as a result of interfacial mismatch. There's always interfacial mismatch under large structure. So one of the terms in the free energy that we have to include is the elastic energy. Then uh, the second term that by virtue of the fact that these ferroelectric materials are piezoelectric themselves. Now, piezoelectricity is the fact that an external electric field can strain a crystal or a strain can, can, uh, can uh, produce a, 
uh, an electric field in a crystal, you now have a depolarization field. So the depolarization field is now counteracting with the elastic energy. And then what happens is that the film would break up into, into, into domains. So for the level of thin film on a substrate, you have these competing terms that allows the system to break up into, into domain to release this, uh, uh, this stress that is coming out from this competition. Now, these domains are the other parameter for the polarization in a, in a standard thin film state. And uh, uh, normally the, uh, the sizes of the domain wall, uh, uh, the scales has the square root of the, of the thickness of the film, but there've been a lot of reports that shows that this can change. So uh, there's a bit of history here for ferroelectric materials. The, it was discovered about close to a hundred years ago, ferroelectricity in, uh, in, uh, in some solid uh, materials. And uh, then later on, we start uh, looking at a uh, high dielectric constant, high uh, uh, dielectric constant here is, an, is a very interesting property. It, it, it's, a, it's a property that uh, relates how much uh, ferroelectric crystal or piezoelectric material can withstand uh, a field without a uh, breakdown. Now, this is very, very important in, in our energy um, uh, application, especially when you want to go beyond memories into, into types of different types of capacitors. I'm going to talk about that. But the main technology for FE RAM, ferroelectric random access memory, you have a multi-layer structure. This is a one scenario. You have a ferroelectric layer, and this layer you can, just like I said, you can have a because of the competition, competing energy, it breaks up into into striped domains with spontaneous polarization pointing up or down as a function of the of uh, the symmetry of the central uh, titanium um, ion. Now, chemi uh, chemically, ferroelectricity has to do with. Uh, with emptiness of the 3D orbital. So if you look at the, the chemical structure of barium titanium, the, the D orbital of the titanium species empty. So that's one of the chemical origin of uh, ferroelectricity. So what we uh, what uh, we've done with a uh, with a couple of with some colleagues of mine in Los Alamos, we we started looking for routes in which we can enhance the uh, Energy star the energy storage, you know, namely the energy density of this ferroelectric material, and uh, the our choice of doing this was to look at um, different uh, symmetrical forms, symmetrical or different forms of topological defects. Topological, uh, to we looked at topology, so we looked at the topology of the polarization texture. So we we. B borrowed this idea from particle physics that tells us that you have domain walls, you have uh, you have de you have uh, dislocations, you have uh, scanions, you have uh, merons, you have uh, different forms of these creatures, these uh, topological relics. So features that are created when symmetry is broken, that what it was created during uh, uh, the Big Bang. So we and the interesting thing is that the energy landscape the uh, the energy landscape that showed the, the cooling of this system is very, very typical to the type of uh, free energy that we have for ferroelectric crystals. So one of the things that we did was that we combined uh, Landau theory, uh, DFT, and a little bit of symmetry analysis and came up with a, a, a structure. So this, the rods are made up of, uh, these are barium titanate rods. You can embed the barium titanate rod in a matrix. The metric is could be STO, strontium titanate, or it, it could be a, a polymer composite. And the interesting thing was that um, depending on the aspect ratio of the rod, we can, uh, we can have scenarios in which a, a single nanowire could admit uh, a vortex or an anti-vortex, or you can have a, a multi-vortex state. Then under the presence of an electric field, uh, we we were able to show that the electric field by switching the chirality of the vortices. So the a vortex right now is uh, one of the topological uh, arrangement of the so the dipolar moment forms a flux closure, and you can you can switch the dipolar moment. You can also drive dynamically drive the, the vortices. Now this actually was we showed that it could it gave much more higher 
energy density. So the energy density is the integral of EDP is the electric field and the P is the polarization. So it actually behooves us to say that if you have a system in which uh, it can admit large electric field and also um, a very uh, a, a very reasonable value of the polarization, basically the area under the EP graph gives us a feeling of the energy and more especially, especially if you are concerned with switching application, you should be able to control tune the value of the remnant polarization. So these are some prototypical samples that uh, we've actually, we are fabricating them. The challenge is to create this type of uh, uh, nano uh, rod in matrices and then we all understand the issues of uh, interfacial strain and then defects would play a role and then uh, a whole bunch of, of uh, complications would come in during uh, processing which deviates uh, a lot from theory. So this is uh, one of the prototypical system that we are actually working to study. Um, most importantly, we show that you can control the aspect ratio and uh, that, con that controls the number of uh, the multi -vort uh, vortex states that could be stabilized in the structure and more specifically the energy density of such a system for the case of the 57 uh, nanometer uh, uh, nano, uh, nanoparticle, uh, nanowire rather, the energy density actually was much more, uh, it was way better than the current uh, state of the art of, uh, of uh, this uh, P, uh, uh, PVD type uh, barium titanate uh, uh, nanocapacitors. So basically, we can the energy storage efficiency can be tuned by tuning the dimensionality of the nano of, of the nano wires. You you're going to smaller dimensions, you're reducing the radius. You are basically you're going to the limit at which you're only controlling the uh, a single. Uh, polar vortices or multipolar vortices. So this, this actually there is some relationship here between the aspect ratio of the vortex core and uh, and the diameter of the vortex of the vortex itself that would actually give you this uh, uh, high energy efficiency. And then of course the goal would be to achieve a uh, hundred percent efficiency. That would be, that would be very very challenging because you would be limiting yourself to uh, to sizes of uh, ionic uh, radius and, and stuff like that. So, and uh, we've made some model diffractions of this type of uh, structures, we can reconstruct them. The challenge of course now is to actually fabricate them and study them. So uh, I'm gonna jump a little bit into gear to some system that we've actually studied experimental uh, uh, samples that has this, uh, where we can control the topology of the other parameter space. Uh, one option here is barium titanate, it's a very old and uh, fascinating uh, ferroelectric material. And the other parameter space we're interested in is the uh, polarization. And we're asking ourselves questions, can we come up with, 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 with different routes in which uh, magnetism could be induced in barium titanate? So barium titanate, as you see, it has no magnetic element. Uh, and tit um, titanium ion, the, uh, the MT3D orbital does not chemically uh, uh, and symmetrically allow barium titanate to have uh, magnetism. Uh, but the, uh, we, 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 I would be able to hopefully convince you, you, you folks at some point that by looking at dynamical properties of, uh, of the ferroelectric polarization texture, meaning the protected topological features that are, uh, are formed, you can actually create some form of uh, dynamic uh, magnetism or by engineering the phase boundaries or by engineering uh, domain walls. Another system that would be interested also is a hexaferrite. Now this is a multiferroic material. It has iron and uh, you have a very interesting competing spin state. Here you have a uh, multiferrous uh, ferroic behavior which comes from uh, coupling between a uh, phonon, phonon mode and uh, phonon mode and, uh, and, uh, and the ground state of the magnetic structure that allows it to drive uh, ferroelectricity. So this is a uh, a magnetic, a magnetic ferroelectric. You have prototypical hexamanganites and stuff like that. But uh, most of those systems, the the ordering temperature is extremely. Uh, it's not close enough to room temperature. So what? So what I'm doing? What what my research? What we're looking at with our collaborators is that we're 
we are looking into candidate ferroelectric materials, multiferric materials, and we try to see under what criterion an electric field, an external stress, meaning or under what external conjugate field can we control and protect different forms of uh, topological uh, features. So uh, the, for example, these are some creatures of uh, relics that could be, uh, you could uh, you could classify the topology. This is a topological charge of, uh, of plus one. Uh, this is also plus one, this is minus one. This, for example, would be an anti-vortex. This would be a prototypical vortex. And then you could also have a, a fractional uh, topological structures. Now, the interesting thing is that with these uh, fractional uh, topological systems, if you can, if you can create this system and then you control the, uh, uh, the band gap, you close up the band gap. So think of a scenario in which you have a ferroelectric nanoparticle, it's BTO, it's insulating, and the crystal has the coexistence of two phases. You have a T phase and you have a, an O phase, then you have a phase boundary. An electric field can also mediate or temperature can mediate this transformation. Now across the phase boundary, if you can, uh, we don't want to go doping because we don't want to change the ground state, but if you could find ways of, uh, of uh, controlling the electronic properties of, of the phase boundary, for example, by uh, using uh, oxygen pressure, or, you know, that would alter the actually defects at the phase boundary would actually alter the, uh, uh, the conductivity. So there's been a lot of report that has shows uh, conductive uh, uh, domain walls and uh, phase boundaries in, in this oxide. Now that means that if you look at the, the band gap, you have something which is almost semi-metallic or semi-conducting. So you can have a phase boundary that could be engineered, for instance, and then the that phase boundary, the texture of that phase boundary could form different types of uh, topological features. So that would be a, an interesting electronic element that would be very, very useful. So um, I'm going to get a little bit into the ferroelectric order. So this is what the uh, the free uh, the, the free the free energy against uh, polarization looks like for a dielectric, a non ferroelectric material it is just this uh, simple uh, behavior. So in here, you this is a higher symmetry phase. So there is no ferroelectric ordering. There is a uh, the the crystal this, this, the crystal structure is uh, is symmetric and symmetric with respect to uh, space. So it, it is, it's a cubic phase. Then this is uh, how the energy landscape looks like for a proper ferroelectric uh, material. You now have uh, these two possible grounds that this would uh, correspond to the polarization pointing up, the polarization pointing down. So either by cooling, either by cooling this system, uh, you can now come up to a scenario where the crystal structure will become, if it's very tight in it, tetragonally strained and then the central titanium ion would now be off-centered and it could be the off-centered titanium ion if you calculate the, the net dipole, the, you know, the distance of the titanium ion to the oxygen to the barium and then you uh, divide that by the volume of the unit cell. So you're going to get some value in, in some microcoulomb per centimeter cube or something like that. You can have two scenarios in which the ion is shifted up, shifted down. So this is the expected uh, energy versus polarization landscape for uh, polarization up, down, or down, up. So these are two states that uh, the uh, quantum physicists would say that if, in a sense, if you can look at the electronic landscape, you could say that it might be a superposition of states if you want to look at that. And for the case of an improper ferroelectricity, it is slightly different from a ferroelectric. In a ferroelectric, the polarization is the other parameter, meaning in your free energy expansion, the polarization itself, it's the th if you minimize this with respect to P, so you take the uh, first the derivative of this with partial derivative with respect to P, you equate it to zero, you're going to be able to find out the values for these coefficients A and B for which uh, you should have uh, stable uh, minimums and then you're going to have these two possible uh, scenarios. But in the case of a, an improper ferroelectric, the polarization is not the primary order parameter, it's more of a secondary order parameter. So uh, actually you, you do have, uh, also have a, a local, you have two local, you have local minima, but it is 
more due to the slaving of our uh, the coupling of our uh, phone on mode with uh, the structural uh, distortion of the crystal of the crystal and uh, to look a little bit into that, I try to put some cartoons here. This is an example of a, of a high symmetry uh, uh, phase for barium titan. It's a high symmetry that would be the cubic phase. If you look at the unit cell of barium titanate, you have a titanium that sits nicely in this uh, octahedra, this, this O6 uh, cage, and then these are the, the, the barium atoms. Now, um, the the loca the location of these with respect to this top plane with respect to this top plane this the, the symmetry is conserved but if you t if this thing becomes tetragonally strained or if you cool it down you move from this higher symmetry phase to the lower symmetry phase you're going to have you can have two scenarios in which the central titanium is shifted up or shifted down so now this and this these are the low symmetry uh, ground state of the system in now the crystal has a, a, a spontaneous, a built-in spontaneous polarization that comes from the minimization of the free energy. And uh, this is mostly uh, uh, the work that was uh, done by uh, by Landau. The highest symmetry, in the highest symmetric phase, the crystal is, uh, the structure is cubic. The ferroelectric uh, or the electronics, the, the, the crystal structure is cubic, the electronic structure is Paraelectric and higher symmetric. So even though the crystal has ions, uh, a snapshot over time symmetry is not broken. P, Px and P minus x, you don't have that uh, inversion symmetry. And you could see the dipoles are some statistical fluctuations uh, averaging over time that doesn't give a net uh, ferroelectric polarization. But if you cool it down, be uh, uh, beyond this TC, you now move into this ferroelectric phase and inversion symmetry would imply that you can switch from, you can move from one ferroelectric well to the next and those are equivalent um, directions. And uh, the, so the Curie temperature is very, very interesting. We normally tune that using uh, temperature, but we, for device applications, we want to use fields, we want to use uh, conjugate fields like electric field or stress and uh, or even magnetic field the challenge would be to ask what other parameter can be controlled by by these uh, systems so i would stick a little bit here to bto now we are in the ground state the low symmetry stable ground state ferroelectric you can see that the ferroelectric uh, phase itself the other parameter now which is the polarization the crystal structure has uh, this rhombohedral octahedral tetrahedral, and then you have the high symmetry uh, cubic phase. Now within this temperature range, you can have this given phase transformation. The interesting thing for us is that we are interested in the phase boundaries, these phase boundaries or domain walls within the given phases. So in, in a T phase, for example, you, if the polarization texture, if, it's a, if you have 180 degrees domains, you're gonna have striped domains pointing up, pointing down within a given phase. So within a given phase, you're gonna have domain walls. Domain walls are usually very small, small as a couple of unit cells and large, uh, up to a few nanometers, 30, 40, depending on the aspect ratio of the, th of the thickness of the film uh, with respect to the interfacial uh, structural strain. But more interestingly, if you move into nanoparticles and uh, and nanowires where you're now eliminating this interfacial strain uh, effect, you have different other terms that comes in uh, as a function of the type of facet that the crystal has, uh, things like the gradient energy, uh, the electrostatic energy, different terms come into play that could actually allow us to, to have much more stable and smaller or even larger sizes of uh, of uh, domain. So within every individual phase, you have domain walls that accounts for each of the individual symmetry. And then across the given phases, you have phase boundaries. So these are all elements that could be tuned and controlled for, for data applications. The phase boundaries could be traditionally bigger. Uh, what would uh, ultimately affect the sizes of the phase boundary would have to do with the uh, chemical potential between the two different uh, phases. 
So this uh, this is just a few slides snapshots of uh, of uh, the texture of the polarization of the parameter in ferroelectric that has been observed by uh, by different groups using uh, 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 scanning uh, microscopy. Um, this uh, this is the the group of uh, Ramesh Ramesh and uh, they actually used uh, Landau theory and uh, and uh, transmission electron uh, microscopy to to map out the formations of uh, of polar domains so in a in a multi layer so they had, they had a multi layer of uh, of lead titanate and strontium titanate and alternating dielectric ferroelectric dielectric ferroelectric layer and then this uh, alternating stack of the, com the, the competition in the gradient elastic energy would allow the system to actually nucleate this stable uh, topological structure. But uh, most of this, uh, when you do electron microscopy and and uh, as we, uh, we are very familiar with, it's uh, very, very difficult to be able to probe the volume. It's difficult to, uh, to apply external fields and uh, look at things in situ and in operando. And this is where exactly uh, we come in with our um, coherent x-rays. So one of the things that we're looking at uh, is that we, we want to look at uh, particles, wires, or thin films in situ, apply an electric field, shoot through them with coherent x-rays, satisfy a given bright condition, and since the polarization scales uh, linearly with the displacement field uh, as given by the, the, uh, the bond effective, effective charge or even from symmetry, we can we construct this this displacement field and use Landau theory to extract the uh, coupling coefficient between elastic strain and the uh, polarization, which is the uh, uh, which has some some uh, which has some tensors actually, and that helps us now to actually reconstruct the ferroelectric polarization. But more interestingly, we are asking ourselves: uh, uh, Are they? Or do we have exciting uh, quantum mechanical or nanoscale behavior that comes in when you have a, uh, you have a phase boundaries, for example, within uh, you have a single nanoparticle that has a coexisting phase. So, you know, there are phase boundaries and within each phase itself, there are domain walls. Can we use those phase boundaries and domain walls as uh, logical elements? Do we now, can we now move and say, okay, the particle it, or the nanowire itself, it's the bulk and then the interface of the domain wall now becomes uh, uh, the non-bulk feature. And then there we have some interesting experiments going on where we are actually, up, we, are, we, are, we formed uh, sintered ceramics. We control grain sizes and we are applying strong magnetic fields in things like barium titanate. And the, the hope here is to, uh, to look if we can create a edge effects, edge effects like you have in topological insulators where you take um, insulator and you apply a, a strong a one Tesla magnetic field and then the edges become conductive because you have electrons that could hop at the edge. So we're asking ourselves, can similar scenarios be created with, with nanocrystals and, uh, and grains where now the, the phase boundaries now become a uh, candidate for, for, for edge. So you would have a crystal which is nominally insulating, but you can, you can close up the, the band gap and, and create exciting states and then the dynamic, the motion of those charges, the topology of those charges could inherently help us address the issue of the presence of magnetic because you want to find a way to be able to read, write and, and control them. So uh, perovskites are very, very interesting. Uh, the structure seems to be simple, but depending on the chemistry, there is a large range of applications that you could get just by looking at different perovskites from from anti-ferroelectric behavior even to uh, uh, superconductivity conductivity that has been observed in, in a doped strontium titanate now. So this is a dielectric. And this also we've seen the been reports of ferromagnetic properties in, in, uh, in SR03. Uh, we say we wanna go be, so most of this is guided by, uh, f uh, by the Landau theory, which is uh, just uh, phenomenology. We wanna go beyond that and understand microscopic mechanism and relevant nanoscopic degrees of, of freedom that would help us correlate displacement uh, to polarization and control polarization uh, texture. And the, the tool of choice for us uh, here is, uh, is uh, 
coherent diffractive imaging, specifically uh, BRA coherent diffractive imaging. Now the challenge is, um, depending on your type of stroke, if you have a, the geometry of your structure, if you have a thin film, a model layer, you have to go into BRA tachography. That's where uh, Stefan Ruskevich is gonna actually come in with Virginie to tell us more about those techniques. I, on the contrary, limit myself to BCDI and try to engineer the technology of single particle, single wire system, because BCDI so far has advanced a little bit better. It's been around for a while. And uh, Dimitri actually gave us a, a sets of codes that are very, very efficient and um, very, very um, robust. So just briefly about BCDI, which uh, we are all very comfortable with, I, I, I presume. If you uh, have uh, um, some degree of uh, coherence in your, in your beam, coherent X-rays, and you have a full illumination of an object, and then you uh, align your sample and your detector to satisfy the bright peak, and you collect your diffraction pattern in the far field. Of course, you can also do it in, in the Fener regime. It just depends on how you want to face the structure and what information you, you're looking at. Now, without loss of generality, if the diffraction pattern is oversampled, uh, to at least uh, twice the Nyquist frequency, you can reconstruct the object shape and the displacement uh, within the crystal. And if you can map uh, uh, three, at least three different collinear reflections, you can you can extract a strain tensor and then you can apply electric field. So um, oversampling, uh, it's, uh, it's extremely important because we have this limited, uh, information that we have in free space because the phases are lost. So oversampling, actually, uh, it's one of the ingredients that you need to to solve for the phase problem. It is a it is a necessary uh, condition, but uh, oversampling on its own is not sufficient. Uh, some degree of coherency, and uh, of course, you have to uh, take care of the type of detector that you're using and uh, a whole bunch of different technical uh, stuff that we're interested in. I'll just jump into one of the applications that was done by uh, Dima, Dimitri Kapov. Uh, a couple of years ago, we uh, uh, Dima was um, uh, we were able to build a ferroelectric uh, capacitor. So we mixed uh, carbon nanoparticles with, uh, with barium titanate in a an epoxy in a polymer matrix, so the same route that is used in the industry to create uh, uh, ferroelectric capacitors, we use those and uh, we now have a, a system in which we had uh, a whole bunch of different uh, particles. We were able to apply electric fields and uh, ensure that we could see a hysteresis loop that is opening up from a banana shape to a, a nice hysteresis loop with saturation. Then we repeated the same experiments uh, in operando now with a coherent x-ray beam uh, coming in and then Landau theory which I've, I've discussed was used to uh, interpret some of the results so what we, what we what we had was that we could apply this was for a particle of about 160 nanometers give or take we apply an electric we, we did not map out the entire hysteresis loop we moved from uh, zero ele electric field and then we increase the field all the way to the maximum field where you have saturation and then now we release the field now to back to remnant the interest we could reconstruct the uh, shape of the particle and the projections of the displacement field one on one displacement on the particle and we can also extract the uh, the polarization the polarization scales with the displacement field but you need um electrostrictive uh, constants. You need those constants from Landau theory to be able to fit the polarization to, uh, so it's really a rescaling problem at the end of the day. The most interesting thing was that at the, 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 the zero electric field and the remnant, which is also zero. So the, the, the virgin state and the, and the remnant state, you could see the changes in the polarization texture. And then this is what we had in the maximum electric field. And we accounted for this uh, from Landau theory by saying that at, at the zero field, you had a single vortex core that was, there's a single vortex that is formed in the nanowire. So the, 
uh, we studied a different series of nanowire and the 160, uh, the 160 uh, diameter nanowire was uh, the reasonable size that where you have just one vortex structure which is protected within the volume of the particle if you move to larger particles you can you can have you're going to have multi multi uh, vortex states and uh, at, at this uh, zero electric field the 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 crystal structure was uh, it was uh, it was a mixture of t of tetragonal and monoclinic phase and as you increase the field up to your maximum field it was uh, predominantly m phase so this phase uh, transformation uh, was actually accompanied uh, uh, by the motion of this uh, vortex core. So the motion of the vortex core was mediated by the phase transformation. And then once you remove the field, it comes back to this uh, global T plus M phase. But interestingly enough, the polarization texture has changed, even though the uh, maximum value of the polar polarization stays the same the texture is changing so you can you can control different types of topology the uh information that we got from cdi which wasn't available from surface scanning or up to when we did the study surface scanning to uh, like uh, micro electron microscopy told us that an electric field could move uh, vortices and this was done through mostly you know polishing and imaging series of polishing and imaging techniques and then and connect connecting the uh, the, uh, the the uh, the core of the vortex to form a vortex string, and what we did here was in operando in situ, and more interestingly, we saw that for this for this field range for up to a field of to about two hundred twenty three kilovolts per centimeter, the vortex uh, has a structure. See uh, what we have here as the core. These are just two two D slices, and you see the core, but uh, the, if you connect the vortex core with, with good enough resolution, you have a one-dimensional nanorod. Now, that one-dimensional nanorod is actually, it is the phase boundary. It's really, literally, it's the phase boundary. And this nanorod, in its sense, it can, it just rotates. The, the nanorod is protected. Electric field simply rotates it. And uh, we do have some current studies that we're trying to look at how the, the rotation of this nanorod within the particle displaces uh, titanium ions and, uh, and barium ions. And we're trying to estimate the amount of uh, magnetic uh, signature that could be produced by, by that. That's one approach. The second approach that we're looking at, this uh, polarization is a conjugate field. It's conjugate to the electric field. So if you look at uh, Maxwell's one of Maxwell's equation the curl of uh, an electric field is uh, minus del b by del t so we're trying to look at ways in which either a time dependent magnetic field should be able to switch the chirality so we just don't want to translate it using a static field but we want to switch the chirality from pointing this away to pointing this away and if you could control uh the switching uh uh, we, um, so far, we think it could be switched using a uh, terahertz uh, uh, frequency. So, if you could, or even gigahertz, if you can control this switching, that's a very, very interesting application where you can read and write using a time dependent magnetic field, for example. And you could also produce magnetism from a, a crystal just by the dynamic. We do have also some studies that we're trying to look at this in, uh, in microwave uh, frequencies. And um, this uh these are some of the experimental parameters and uh this is just uh the raw the raw data uh the most important thing like actually dimitri mentioned in his talk it's uh you need a uh, pretty good uh you need state of the art de de uh, detectors you need to ensure that you can isolate individual crystals you need to be able to take into account uh, things like uh, uh beam pressure radiation pressure you need to ensure that your electric field once you your your effect of your electric field is uh, moving normal to the Debye-Scherer rings, not along the Debye-Scherer rings. So if we, if you see stuffs happening this way, it would probably be radiation pressure. You're just moving the crystal around, or you're just moving from one crystal to the next. So these were extremely uh, time-consuming experiments that, uh, that Dimitri did for over a couple of weeks. And even though we had these particles in epoxy and then in a polymer matrix that they were supposed to be really tightly held together. The radiation uh, pressure was uh, 
sufficient enough to actually uh, move some of these uh, some of these particles. So, so this was a uh, it was a little bit uh, a, a twist of the hand to be able to stabilize uh, these particles. And um, this is uh, just the uh, uh, the preparation procedure. We we the capacitor was uh, about two by two by one millimeter cube. We had epoxy polymer metric uh, with 40% carbon on the particle and and what Dimitri was doing is that he was increasing, uh, he was following routes that are done in, in uh, industrial, uh, in commercial uh, devices uh, by make, by playing with this, uh, uh, the fracture of, uh, of carbon nanoparticles to that of the barium titanate while he's looking at the hysteresis loop to ensure that the loop is, is uh, opening up to regions in which you start have ferroelectric switching. And, and the model that he came with to interpret what we were seeing, uh, he suggested that it has to do with the fact that the carbon, he being Dimitri, that the carbon nanoparticles should be able to form nice enough contact on close to individual particles for it to be able to uh, contact. So uh, this, is, uh, this is an example of a, of a nanoparticle which we call active, where you we we have good carbon contacts next to it, and the presence of the voltage or electric field can actually switch them. You could see uh, the symmetry is broken. We're creating these satellites, meaning that the domain walls around the vortices are moving. And this was a particle that uh, the field just didn't do anything. We just saw breathing modes, uh, a little bit of changing in, in the intensity counts and, and stuff like that. And uh, we also, we have the Landau theory that would help us interpret what we're seeing. What comes into the Landau free energy, which is different from the case of a thin film, is that you uh, you have the elastic en uh, energy density term that comes in. You have the gradient energy. The gradient energy has to, it takes into account the, the types of facets that you can have different facets in your, in your particle. And every individual fac facet has a, a given, uh, uh, planar density, so the density of atoms on a given plane is different, so the energies would be different. And there's the gradient energy, and then of course there's the electrostatic energy that comes in because these are uh, this this differences in uh, in atomic packing and hence displacement would create some inbuilt um, electrostatic field. So taking all of this into consideration and then minimizing uh, the Landau. Uh, free energy term. This is what you need to show the stability of, of vortices. So basically, a competition between these four terms would uh, uh, allow the formation of uh, topological uh, vortices. And I've already shown this slide before, but the most important thing I wanted to show here is that uh, this term, the so-called um, um, electro electrostrictive uh, coefficients, for example, you, you need to calculate the, these terms have, have to be calculated from Landau theory. And then uh, you can extract the strain from multiple reflections. And that would help you get projections of the displacement field. For this case, we looked at the 111, we looked at the 100, uh, zero, zero, and we look at the 110. And then one of the most important features from this experiment is the fact that the uh, you have a new order parameter, which is the toroidal moment. So the toroidal moment, and this is the extra polarization. So if you take a particle and you increase, you apply an electric field, your particle, your Landau theory is guaranteed to stabilize the presence of a vortex or you make a heterostructures structures like I mentioned the others are doing. What happens is that now, depending on the external electric field that you're able to apply or heterostructure here would be the strain. You have a couple of, you have this region from zero field to about 250-ish, uh, where you have a very strong uh, extra polarization. But this region over here, uh, the toroidal moment of one, meaning that you have uh, a curl. Toroidal moment of zero means that you have no curl. They're just dipolar structures. So you can control electric field strength you can apply from zero to a hundred and back to zero, or from you can move from twin from from two fifty to three hundred and back to two fifty, depending on what type of topological structure you want to protect. If you go if you go beyond this region, you are gonna 
unwind them. You're going to, you're going to rotate the curve, the, the, the vortex structure out of the plane, and you might actually cause the system. You might actually have a complete phase transformation. So a T and M phase could become all, all homogeneously T with some small fractions of M or things like that. So basically you have a, a nice tool here where you can control uh, topological structures uh, by virtue of the size of the particle and hence the terms in your lambda or uh, free energy parameter, you can optimize a uh, number of vortices to aspect ratio or size of particle. And more specifically, various forms of uh, phase transformation can, uh, is what it's, need, it's needed to nucleate or to allow the motion of these uh, uh, protected uh, uh, vortices. So a small conclusion just on this part of, of the talk is that the, the vortex core is, uh, is a stable one-dimensional rod. And uh, this uh, rod is uh, topologically protected for a given electric field. And uh, it can be transformed. It can also be erased and rewritten using an electric field. And this dynamical motion of the vort of the 1D rod is uh, hysteresis. It has a a history it remembers uh, even though the texture is different the uh, the uh, the maximum polarization uh, is uh, stays uh, the same um, in, in case there there are no questions how am I doing on, on time uh, well it is uh, three o'clock now <laughs> okay okay cool uh, yeah. so uh, if you feel like it's a good moment to take a break maybe we can take some questions yeah, well, sure. How long are you planning to continue? Uh, we can take some break and I could, I have about 10, 15 more minutes. I'll talk on a, a second order parameter, which is now the uh, uh, ferroelastic, but I'm open to questions. And, uh, okay, so maybe this is a, this is a, a good moment because maybe some people may have a, maybe some limited slot. Come on, don't be shy, please. Unmute yourself or raise your hand. Okay, I see Carlos, please. All right. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, so, I mean, it's more or less like uh, some uh, doubts on what, when you mentioned, for example, uh, that you use these carbon particles to make like a proper connection. Mm -hmm. uh, did you, did you able to see those particles or you just know that you have something because you have the proper response from your Electric field. Yeah, so we, I mean, we, we can see those particles uh, using traditional um, um, X ray techniques. I mean, uh, uh, carbon has a very small uh, cross section uh, atomic number. Uh, with neutrons, you could see them, of course, but we, our, uh, the measure of uh, our success metric for us was the hysteresis loop when the loop is able to open. So the, the, uh, the idea of the connection of the carbon nanoparticle to the uh, oxide nanoparticle for us to have conductivity is a one is one possible explanation. It could, but there could be possibly something else since we cannot see them. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I, I have another question, just kind of curious. You you mentioned radiation pressure. That I think I mean you you basically saw your particles moving, right? Yeah. Uh, do you think it? Uh, it could be anything related to some kind of radiation damage so that you may be also uh, changing or, of course, I don't know if what you mean by radiation pressure, but some kind, somehow changing the epoxy, the surrounding of the particle uh, yeah, that, due to radiation damage? Yeah, that's actually, that was a very, uh, that was a possibility that we, we considered. We actually have a paper, I could send it to you, where we, uh, we uh, we just did radiation. We use radiation pressure to on uh, on nickel nanowire to bend nickel nanowires and to uh, to move around uh, uh, palladium nanocubes and we're able to estimate the radiation pressure. It's uh, it was somewhere for that was for for Rossi's beam line thirty four IDC at at nine keV with a, a two by two uh, micron beam. We had radiation pressure of about it was ten atto newton. So the the force was ten atto newton, and and this uh, when you are doing this at 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 the brack, it is uh, uh, it is it is not 
it's not sufficient to so the, to, when the momentum transfer is so when you are normal to the back you to the scattering planes and your q vector is normal to those planes you do have radiation pressure which basically pushes on the lattice for that plane but it's 10 out of newton it is uh, quite small and yeah you could have other top other, other other things that are happening around but that fair electric polarization that is accounted for from that projection of the lattice um would not be ultimately affected at least that's what we think but this is something which i think would be extremely useful to study especially if you're looking at at highlight perovskite where the environment plays a very very uh, important role but yes that's something to, to consider okay. okay thank you very much yeah thank you carlos anna uh, thank you Thank you for the talk, uh, Edwin. So my question, um, I mean, I, I apologize for my ignorance doing this question, but so I understand that Brax CDI is uh, sensitive to displacement fields, okay? So if you have a vortex in the displacement field, it's because you have some sort of point effect in your crystal, right? Like in the atomic lattice. Now, what you are interested in, I think, is in topological, uh, defects in po the polarization, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. this is not exactly the same, I think. And mm -hmm. then the, the question is, how does this relate? So if you see a vortex in the in the in the displacement field, does does this mean automatically that it is also a vortex in the polarization? Or no, no, not necessarily. Sorry, actually, yeah. So they, um, that's that. It's not an ignorant. It's a it's a very good question. So. Um, so you could have a couple of uh, things. So if you, uh, you could have a ferroelastic, that's actually where I wanted to go to next, and you could have a ferroelectric. So the the standard signature of, uh, let's say, stripe domain is uh, this lattice distortion. So across the across the domain wall, you have this, uh, uh, you, you, you see this singularity in your, in your phase map. And then if you unwrap the phase and everything and the singularity is still maintained, it means that it's traditional means if it's one, you have a 180 degrees uh, domain wall. So you can always estimate the types of domain wall uh, from this. Now, uh, the vortex is created when you have uh, when you have a flux closure. So if you, uh, so if you have, uh, let, me, let me see if I can go back to, uh, let me go just like, over here, just a second. I think I have a slide for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, when you have a, a flux closure, so for example, uh, if you look at this state and this state, for example, this could just be 180 degrees uh, domain wall. So, if you have two domain walls that intersect, for example, and then you would uh, it creates some sort of a flux closure. So this will be mirror to this, this will be mirror to this, for example. And the in the structural uh, signature, you in the displacement field, you're gonna you're gonna be able to see a phase uh, reasonable phase jump that is uh, uh, it's 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 similar to these changes in the lattice. Uh, and you're gonna in, in this way versus this way. So but the the interesting point here is that. You can have this type of features even when the phase doesn't change from minus pi to pi. You can have uh, fractional changes from minus pi over two to plus pi over two. We we normally account to those as uh, to be fairly elastic domains. So we 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 go on a couple of things. We go on the fact that the polarization from the Born effective charge approximation is linearly proportional to the displacement. So now the displacement, of course, you have displacements of, of ions and electronic displacement if you go into the picture but from the bond effective charge if you have the polarization field you uh, if you have the displacement field you can extra you can also extract the polarization from that uh, bond effective charge now the topological features in the polarization texture that we're looking at you can see them in the polarization but it doesn't it wouldn't necessarily exist in the displacement field uh, you you're right about about that CDI directly gives us, uh, reconstructs the displacement. And the only way for us to get the polarization is that you need to be able to come out with the, uh, with the electric, with this uh, Q tensor from, uh, from, uh, from Landau theory. Now that Q tensor on its own right now, if you, if you map out uh, 
individual projections of the tensor, it, it, you would see regions in which the, the tensor itself admits singularities or not. And that multiplied by that reconstructed uh, displacement field would, would, for a given isosurface would show you the uh, polarization. Yeah, so it would be very neat if we could find a, uh, a unique way of being sensitive to the polarization itself uh, directly. And I, I think I think the tool, one tool towards this would be to combine um, polarized uh, X-ray uh, resonance, polarized X-ray, and even even twisted light. So, so if you are uh, uh, traditional, uh, um, um, uh, traditionally, if you have resonance scattering, you are sens you have dichroism, you are sensitive to, to dichroism, but uh, X-rays are not sensitive to quadrupolar moment, which is what you're trying to do to our current. Um, X-ray scattering, we scatter with dipolar charges. Quadrupolar moment in the feral, in the electric electric field, we are not sensitive to. And the only way to be sensitive to quadrupolar moment would be to have uh, a beam that carries topological charge itself. That's the way we'll be uniquely uh, uh, sensitive to to this uh, to true polarization texture. So what we're doing here is that we are reconstructing displacement field, and then we are we are modeling. Uh, coefficients of uh, that correlates the polarization and the displacement, then we use that to map out the polarization. So it is not a true mapping of polarization per se, because uh, we are only sensitive to the displacement field. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank a, you. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's, it's a pretty good, it's a, it's a pretty good question. I, I, yeah. Uh, other people with burning questions? I don't know if there is anybody among you who does similar type of research. Oh, hi, hi, Edwin. <laughs> and uh, just curious about the, the paper, the, the paper you and uh, Dimitri on the nature of communication paper, you find a vortex in the B2O nanoparticle. And how often are they exist in the B2O nanoparticle in your sample? How often? Yeah, how often you find a vortex in your particle? Uh, yeah, so we, 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 don't find the, we don't find a vortex in every particle. So that's mm -hmm. that's the first thing, um, and then uh, we, for we 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 started we started we looked at a whole bunch of different individual particles, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe out of ten or twenty particles, we see a vortex in one or two. Then we started uh, Dima started asking, but there should be a way in which you have to know because we're just going by how the symmetry is broken in in displacement mm -hmm. in, in diffraction to know if there's a vortex, and then making a model to see mm -hmm. if that model diffraction looks like the, 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 the experimental one. But Dima did a couple of interesting things to stabilize vortices. What he, he came up with a very, very nice technique of, uh, he, he, he was quenching the particles. So if you, if you heat up the part, if, you, if we, he, you take your barium titanate nanopowder and then you, you sinter it into a ceramic and then you, you heat it up above, for, uh, above the, uh, the Curie temperature. So for barium titanate, you go above 200, 300, degrees C and then you then now he quenches it. You so he, he goes at different with <laughs> we were able to have a larger fractions of particles that vortices were were stabilized. So that's kind of what uh, what we did to to stabilize more vortices. So we think what is happening there is that during if you quench the system, if you heat it up and quench it quench it, you are nucleating uh, different forms of uh, of higher symmetry phases into lower symmetric ground state. So one other thing that we saw, which I haven't discussed, we saw particles that you had the formations of this so-called polar nano region. So you have a particle in which, in the particle you have small puddles of cubic, yeah. phase, cubic phase things, you know, but if you control your cooling rate just in, in the ferroelectric phase, mm -hmm. you, can, you, can, you can nucleate better O or R or T, different types mm -hmm. of domain. Um, uh, and vortices. So that was the way of actually ensuring that we can stabilize uh, and uh, have uh, more vortices or, or stable vo or, or stable vortex in the particle. That's that's kind of what we do right now. Yeah, and for for the quenching, are you quenching in the air or quenching in the vacuum? Oh, we're we're quenching in vacuum. In if, vacuum, ah. Yeah. yeah, if you quenching in air, we uh, we actually the the quenches that we have have in air, we it, the system forms are. Uh, a core shell particle as we come so you have you have a core that is cubic and then yeah no fair electricity and then you have a shell so but that's a very interesting system because it still has you can still have some vortices in them but they are not uh, 
they're not stable enough. Mm. I mean, the, the culture, you mean the, the, the model proposed by the Japanese, like? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, the, the model proposed uh, by the Japanese. Yeah, yeah. So that's a uh, very... Yeah, I, I think that they, they found this culture is just a possibility, right? They never, they never see it. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, they, they haven't seen, so I saw the paper and then I, I was actually thinking of talking to them so we can actually uh, measure that and uh, use the, I mean, we've actually measured it, use the theory, the theory and the argument to understand what exactly we're seeing in a, in a causal model of a particle. Because you have a interesting behavior of the elastic constant, you have a region in which you have the gradient elastic mm -hmm. constant and then, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a rich, interesting system that shows different, it shows more stripe-like domain, but the texture is uh, is uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the picture should be very diffuse, right? Because you have a cubic core, core cubic shear and tetragonal core, so you have like the intensity in both in both part of the brain, and also have some intensity in between. So, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. So I, I think what would be interesting would be uh, some sort of like relax our properties of that kind of a system. It would be nice to. Uh, to study the relaxer properties of uh, that kind of a system. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Edwin, I have a question for you, which is a little bit more, more general. You touched upon very lightly on the uh, quality of the beam and the, you know, the, the, the intensity of the coherent beam that you were using. And yeah. seeing that this uh, series of seminars is actually uh, nesting a little bit also uh, within the scientific case for uh, bright sources, I was wondering, for this type of research, what is the added value of an increased coherent flux? That, that's the first question. For example, does resolution matter? You were mentioning um, simulation on, on uh, less than 100 nanometer uh, particles or nanowires, and then you are showing results on more than 100 nanometers. So is next step going to smaller particles? But also, uh, is the coherence enough or beam lines should, what, what else, what are other experimental challenges that beam lines have to consider? You know, what is the extra equipment, if there, if there is any need for it, for yeah. a successful experiment of this type? Yeah, so, uh, so thanks, uh, uh, Dina, actually, so it's, a, it's a very, very important and interesting question. Uh, the coherence for us was, uh, I think it is, uh, very, very important because the resolution that we had from those reconstruction was uh, somewhere around 18, between 18 to 20 nanometers. And we are resolving uh, one D uh, rod that is about 30 nanometers. So we don't, we, we barely have enough uh, pixels left to be able to understand the nature of the vortex wall. Uh, so that, so that's, if you want to look into deeper physics, if, uh, if, uh, topological structures themselves, uh, like domain walls or phase boundaries could be used as, uh, as functional elements. You, we, need to, uh, we need to go down to, to, to better resolutions like five nanometers as, uh, as uh, Andrew had in, in one of his science papers. So, so, so then coherence becomes extremely important for us to, uh, to get better resolution. I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm working on, we're trying to make some models in which we, we, we had modeling forward problem where we, we use Landau to create a, a, a nice looking 3D image where you can see the, uh, the domain walls and you can see either head to head or tail to tail domain wall telling you they are charged and stuff like that. And then you simulate the forward uh, scattering problem and then you try to see, to, uh, to go backward for that to understand what are the requirements on the flux? What are the requirements on the coherence and what types of uh, pixels on the detector do I need and sample distance to resolve this? So resolution is, is really, really important for us. That's one thing. Then uh, one of the, the challenges that we, uh, we had, uh, which is also now it is this issue of radiation pressure. You sometimes you find a pretty good particle, you're excited about it. You set it up, do, set your rocking scan you go for coffee or something, you come back, the particle is gone. And then you, you're searching for the particle again, maybe the next five, 10 minutes, you, you cannot find, you, you can't find the particle. It's, you, not have, you don't know what's happening, if it's, it's beam damage or it's just radiation pressure. So, so there, there are lots of avenues that we would like to explore better, especially issues of uh, radiation pressure on the, 
on, 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 on polarization, that's one thing. And then in the sample environment, applying electric fields is also very challenging because on your genometer, I mean, you have, uh, you, have, uh, you have electrodes coming into your sample, you have very limited degree of freedom. So sometimes uh, there were a couple of days that we could only go to one more one reflection. We just couldn't rotate everything around. So, so it's, uh, there are a couple of things that uh, we would hope that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the beam line uh, over time we can, we can develop better to aid this type of experiment, like uh, ha having uh, better ways of applying uh, electric electric field, and more importantly, we, uh, if we could synchronize uh, synchronizing uh, the electric field with the uh, with the with, uh, with the pulse structure of the of the synchrotron is uh, would be something which would be uh, fundamentally interesting for us, especially if we want to move to to, to, to time dependent e field. So if you want to apply a uh, very rapidly oscillating field, just like not as rapid as you, because rapidly you would just use terahertz, you use lasers and stuff like that. But we want to do a uh, time dependent e field where we can control the power shape, the power structure and pulse duration. If you can synchronize those train of pulses with, uh, with the time structure of the synchrotron, that would be uh, extremely interesting because you can do time dependent switching of chirality and you can track down the things how they are, they are moving. So those are some of the uh, technical uh, requirements that I, I feel for now would be very, very interesting. More importantly, things within this uh, would be to have uh, magnetic fields. So um, I just came up from an NSF uh, review panel where uh, Cornell University, so the Czechs was uh, funded to have a uh, 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 a high magnetic field uh, beamline. So, so now the experiments that we, we have, we've done experiments on magnetostriction and and uh, and radiation, and even where we apply, uh, we use DC magnetic field. So we, uh, to uh, to in, to look at giant magnetostriction in nanowire. So uh, it would also be very interesting if we can have a stabilized type of the, of uh, dipolar to uh, quadrupolar, hexapolar magnetic fields that could be applied in the sample environment. So sample environment is very, very useful for us. External perturbation of E field, magnetic field, it just, and then uh, synchronizing it to the pulse structure, if it's possible, if you want to look at the, if you want to look at oscillating fields, it would be, it would open very, very new uh, avenues. And this would link directly to coherence and to the structure. So that's, that's kind of a, uh, that's my feeling. So technically a better resolution, I, it would be nice to have more resolution. We've been trying to actually get beam time at the X view, but it's been, it's been very, very challenging and you know how it is. So, so uh, it would be where, where we use a pump probe experiment, where we use a fast uh, optical uh, terahertz uh, lasers. The idea here is that the, the rapidly varying electric field of these lasers should be able to, uh, to resonate uh, these topological charges. So if you can resonate them, it's, uh, it becomes uh, a Maxwell's problem. You could, you're hoping that some magnetic field will be created and that pushes you back to either think of doing neutron experiments in which you uh, have a laser uh, oscillating charges and then you're doing some sort of polarized you know, neutron reflectometry or small angle uh, neutron scattering to try to see uh, what the magnetic texture looks like or or, or just what symmetry uh, are, are forming. So, so, so there are some interesting things that I would be excited to see magnetic fields at, uh, uh, you know, beam lines that especially Bragg beam lines that have a magnetic sample environment and flexible electric sample environment and, and optical.